It seems that on this day, that this conference is quite appropriate, given what's happened, I guess, in the past 24 to 48 hours in the world. We have um, had some very devastating news out of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Our president uh, was at, in Delaware um, at Dover uh, when the bodies of our servicemen came back um, early this morning. So I think it's very appropriate that we are here together and the title of this conference, we may not ever achieve complete world peace, but um, certainly uh, an effort to g move in that direction and uh, create a more peaceful coexistence is hopefully the goal of all of us. So with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, our first panel. Uh, gentlemen, if you could please come up. We've had a change. Our, the chair of our panel, uh, Dr. Jane Gaffney, is not with us this morning. She's uh, had a sudden change of plans. So we have Dr. Green here with us today, uh, and he will be moderating our panel. The panel is entitled Preventing Violence and Achieving World Peace. We have with us today Professor John Davies, University of Maryland College Park, Peter Kovach from the U.S. State Department, Ambassador David Newton from the Middle East Institute, and it seems we've had another change. Yes? No? There's an empty seat. And I believe we are waiting, and I'm sure he will come momentarily, soon, before the panel finishes, we hope, uh, Imad ad -Din. And he is the, uh, he's a professor, um, and he teaches uh, at the University of Maryland and at Georgetown. And he's also the president and founder of the Minaret of Freedom in Washington, D.C. So please help me in welcoming our very distinguished panel. <laughs> Our first speaker is Dr. Davies, member of the faculty of the University of Maryland here at College Park. And we're very honored that he is a member of this panel. And he will talk about the theme of this panel, Preventing Violence and World Peace. It's an honor for me to, to join a, a panel of uh, distinguished speakers uh, of the level that we have this morning and to focus on a topic that is close to my heart and uh, to bring what I can, uh, particularly from the uh, findings of our research over the last 15 years from the perspective of social science, to be able to understand the causes of war and uh, the uh, possibilities for being able to prevent it and uh, transform it into to transform conflict into the motivation for constructive change and uh, human advancement rather than it being a, uh, a scourge of humankind. So let's go to the first slide, if we can. So this slide uh, summarizes the trends over the last 60 years since the end of World War II. If we could show the whole last, uh, if we could show a much longer time frame, we would see that this last 100 years has been by far the most violent period in human history. Uh, the uh, second or uh, two or according to some three uh, world wars that have occurred during that time are amongst the very most deadly in human history. Uh, the period that we show here, which is the focus of our research on the post-World War II period, shows the increasing destabilization of the world throughout the Cold War period. From the mid-50s, uh, the number of wars and the intensity of war 
as reflected in the number of people killed in fighting, the amount of damage to the social infrastructure that allows people to be able to earn their livings and, and uh, meet their human needs. And the uh, number of people displaced, a number of broken families, etc. All of these uh, are uh, feed into a measure of intensity of war each year. So each war, uh, each year, we track around the world for the level of its intensity. And these graphs represent the total intensity of violence around the world, taking all these measures into account. So that we can see that throughout the Cold War, it was a, an unsustainable, unstable equilibrium that increased in violence each year. The red line represents the number and intensity of interstate wars, including wars of independence. And uh, the blue line, uh, by far the dominant form of warfare now, represents internal or societal wars. And these are the ones that particularly became dominant uh, through the Cold War period. The dotted line represents roughly the end of the Cold War. And we can see a remarkable uh, drop by almost 40% uh, of the level of violence around the world. Something that we don't notice from just tracking the headlines because as we know the media tends to focus us on what uh, gets our attention, which is uh, the areas of insecurity rather than on the causes of security and growth. So the yellow line simply represents the total of the red and the blue lines. But uh, this period between the 70s and the 90s is referred to by some of my colleagues as the Third World War. Uh, and that it had comparable number of human uh, civilian casualties as the First and the Second World War. First World War was the most deadly ever, but only about 5% of people killed then were civilians. Uh, Second World War, about 50% killed actually in the course of battle. As many people die after the battle is over, also mostly civilians. Uh, but uh, by, by World War II, it was 50%. This is when we saw the use of nuclear weapons, the use of carpet bombing of cities, etc., as a strategy of war for the first time. And uh, then in the, what uh, my colleague sometimes calls the Third World War, between 75 and 95, uh, the proportion was 85% civilians killed. So a comparable number of civilians killed in each of uh, those three world wars. The Third World War fought in the Third World by proxy between the superpowers rather than directly. So we need to understand the causes behind the rise in violence over this period particularly, and the reasons behind the fall in violence over the last 15, 20 years. Of course, that uh, downward trend is by no means guaranteed or stabilized. Here's another way of looking at the same data. This is uh, the dotted line just represents the number of wars now without, without it being weighted. And uh, we can see uh, the same general outline. What we see down the bottom are the number of new wars starting each year. And we can see that there's not much change since the end of the Cold War. What has really shifted is not our ability to prevent war at this stage, but uh, our ability to be able to respond constructively in ways that are much more likely to lead to negotiated uh, settlement um, than was the case during the Cold War. In fact, there have been more negotiated settlements of war over these last 15, 20 years than there had been in the previous 200 years of world history. So an extraordinary shift in, uh, in the <coughs> approach to understanding war and peace building. Uh, some people say, well, you know, the Cold War is over, now it's the war on terror. We need to focus on the new threat to humankind. Well, I disagree. If we look just at the, if we take out just those attacks that took place in Iraq, which uh, part of the motivation of, of uh, the war in Iraq was to be able to counter terrorism. What was the result of that? is that we've seen a huge spike in the number of terrorist events recorded uh, in the theater of war in Iraq. We just take out those events from the uh, ongoing war in Iraq, then we drop down to the dotted lines, and we can see that the, uh, the curves uh, follow more closely the uh, curve of total violence around the world that we mentioned, uh, that we viewed in the last graph. 
increasing throughout the Cold War, dropping sharply after the end of the Cold War. However, uh, during the last eight or nine years, uh, increasing significantly back up toward their peak, uh, toward uh, late in the Cold War. And uh, so we need to look very carefully at the policies which have led to the war on terror. Following the war on terror, we see a rise in terrorist events, not a reduction in terrorist events. And uh, I would say all of that rise we can find uh, in theaters of war such as Iraq. Almost all the increase in terrorism uh, is, is uh, not taking place outside wars, but it's part of simply a shift in strategy in ongoing wars. So the point is the worst approach to take in the war on terror is to declare war in the border. And of course, we know this is not only natural causes, but uh, is in large part now uh, exacerbated by human action and can in large part, has to in large part be reversed through human action. Increased political, economic, or cultural restrictions uh, that exacerbate the uh, need for justice, social and distributed justice, the capacity for effective participation to be able to meet our needs. And third, uh, the uh, state discrimination or informal discrimination uh, cuts across our need for respect, recognition, identity. Uh, second area is the salience of group identity. Again, economic, or political, or cultural discrimination will make salient our separate group identity. If, as for example, Kurds in Turkey, we are discriminated against in any of these ways, this will make our separate identity more salient than our shared identity, either as Turks or as human beings. And this is a destabilizing process. Second, persistent protest over 10 years is one of the strongest indicators, because it allows time to be able to build leadership and cohesion uh, capacity, in other words, and to be able to demonstrate uh, whether or not the government is, willing to, uh, is able or willing to be responsive um, in addressing the grievances that uh, motivate the protest. Intensity of past conflict and extent of cultural differential is also important. Cultural, this last one doesn't mean that cultural diversity is a risk factor. It's not. The safest countries are those that are most culturally diverse, contrary to popular perception. Uh, they're more safe than the mono-ethnic, mono-religious countries. Uh, but where a, uh, a single group is discriminated against systematically, this destabilizes the situation, uh, makes that separate group uh, more salient, and uh, creates the conditions for war. So for example, one of the reasons for the drop in violence over the last 15 years, we can see in the brown line, is the systematic uh, reversal of government uh, regulations that discriminate against minority groups. And uh, you can see a, a less sharp drop in informal or societal discrimination. There's still a long way to go on that front. Third, group capacity for collective action. Uh, the main requirements for group capacity are financial resources. Do we have the money to be able to uh, pay for salaries, for weapons, and to make a profit for those involved in challenging the state through war? This is a, a, a critical factor. And typically, uh, where there's easy money from uh, handling drugs, and the war on drugs make this extremely easy. Places like Afghanistan, Burma, uh, northeastern India, I've just come back from, is awash with money from the informal black economy fueled by drug trafficking particularly. It uh, allows much better economic prospects for unemployed young men than the formal economy. So financial resources is a big one. It's going to be very difficult to uh, promote any improvement in Iraq well, if we want to continue to uh, pursue the war on drugs in the way it has been pursued so far. The proportion of population with military experience and weapons, one of the key uh, indicators that we use, authentic, authentic leadership, plus um, cohesive pre-existing group organization. And uh, corresponding with that, if there's reduced support for non-militant groups and cross-cutting or moderate organizations, um, then this is also a risk <coughs> So, for example, we can see that uh, a, a contributing factor to the drop in violence over the last uh, 15, 20 years has been the uh, shift in ideology of uh, aggrieved uh, ethno-political organizations uh, away from violent politics, the red line, 
and toward greater engagement in uh, de democratic electoral politics and nonviolent protest uh, politics. Uh, domestic opportunity factors. The biggest one is states that uh, look democratic but uh, scratch the surface, they operate autocratically. These are states that raise hope, raise the illusion of progress, but then destroy hope through, uh, through uh, undercutting democratic mechanisms and uh, imposing conditions on people without their uh, involvement. So these systems are typically, I'd say about seven times more prone to war than other systems. So it's one of the basic uh, indicators that we use. Regime transitions, history of repression and militarization, weak or poor states with limited resources relative to needs. And uh, next one, weak social support we focus on as well. Um, single indicator is probably the single highest best indicator of war coming is high rates of infant mortality. If we don't provide our young women with the support that they need to be able to bring children into the world and to raise them effectively in their early years, then this is an, uh, a, uh, the most accurate measure we have of a state that is not addressing human needs, that is, in fact, uh, brutalizing its people and creating the, the conditions for expanded violence. Demographic stress, uh, particularly a youth bulge, if uh, the youth are not given the opportunity to be involved in the formal economy, then they will be attracted into the informal and violent uh, mechanisms of potential challenges to the status quo. So for example, uh, sometimes it's thought that well, perhaps it's the, sh the growth in number of democracies that has caused the, the drop in violence. Not so. Democracies tend to be less involved than autocracies in violence, uh, particularly in internal violence. And we've seen a shift from, in the 70s, almost three times as many autocracies as democracies. The Cold War was a bad time for uh, new democracies. They tended to last less than five years. They'd become autocratic within a short time because the two superpowers were backing uh, with military aid uh, whoever would uh, declare themselves on their side, uh, whether rebel or government. Uh, by the mid-90s uh, or early 2000s, we see almost the reverse of that. We have about three times as many democracies as autocracies for the first time in human, human history. However, what we see in the red line is a uh, sharp rise at the end of the Cold War in the number of these middling states that are not, neither democratic nor autocratic, that made some democratic shift, but uh, then stuck, were resisted shifting to be full democracies. And these are a huge destabilizing factor and, and uh, a key factor why we see so much instability in Africa right now and uh, throughout the Middle East and uh, the Arab world. Uh, international opportunity factors, the last uh, cluster, thank you, uh, that uh, violence or repression in the <coughs> neighboring countries is the big one. So the fact that uh, Africa and uh, uh, Middle East and North Asia are uh, unstable places make it even more difficult for, people to, uh, for countries to be able to transition to peace, sustainable peace, or to democracy. Uh, so I'm going to skip through from there. And uh, just look, the one region in the world which has not joined the general trend toward greater democracy is the Middle East region and the Arab world. You can see there's just two or three democracies in the whole region, uh, an increased number of uh, anocracies, that's the mixed uh, democratic autocratic, such as Egypt, for example, have just come back from working with Egypt uh, over negotiations on the Nile. And uh, we see elections being carried out there but in fact, what happens is that serious challenges mysteriously get jailed and beaten up and uh, deeply intimidated from engaging in politics in a serious way. And uh, so the, uh, we need to look, particularly one of, the, one of the factors that I mentioned before was dependency on international aid or on trade in a single commodity, for example, oil. And uh, so oil politics has led to Western policy which has uniquely exempted the Arab world and the Middle East from support for democratization. Sometimes people declare we're all for democracy in the Middle East, but they don't follow through. It's happened uh, egregiously during the last uh, uh, administration, leading to a real rise in anger and resentment toward the West, and particularly the US. 
So it's that as if this region hasn't got the support that the rest of the world has, uh, has had to be able to transition to democracy. And this is a very, very ill-advised and short-term strategy for the West. We need to be able to shift and recognize the need to be able to liberate people from the constant oppression that they live under. Otherwise, we'll see increasing uh, resort to terrorism and to violence. So uh, finally, I want to uh, point to four different approaches to conflict management and peace building. The conventional approaches tend to be control-based. How do we suppress terrorism? How do we stop people fighting on the streets? Uh, and so we invest huge amounts in our security forces and uh, expect them to be able to bring peace. You know, the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq was done with very little planning other than military planning. Total unawareness of the need to equally focus, at least equally focus, on rights-based, needs-based, and unity approaches. Rights-based is where we focus on ethics. What is the right thing to do in con a conflict? Not just try to suppress violence, but to attract people to work with us uh, to step onto the high ground of ethical behavior, to be able to um, resolve conflicts in terms of deciding and agreeing on what is right. This is the basis of democracy, to be able to pass laws that reflect and are, are, are legitimized, not because someone has, has power, but because the laws reflect our ethical sense of what's right and what's good. Needs-based approach uh, goes even deeper because rights, our concept of what's right and what's wrong is deeply influenced by our cultural traditions and religious traditions. So how do we make peace across cultures and religions? We look at the human needs which underlie and inform these different cultures. Rights are a way, uh, uh, formulating ways of being able to protect uh, our capacity to address our human needs. And uh, so across culture, what we've found is that most effective is to be able to uh, focus on what is it that people need. The, the forces in Afghanistan have only just, and in Iraq, have only just in the last year or so been given the guidance to be able to talk with the local people and find out what they need. How can we help you? Hasn't been done before. We went in with force, not knowing, not uh, in dialogue with the people on the ground about what was needed, coming in uneducated, about what was motivating, motivating violence on the ground. So this, this is a huge shift that is only beginning to take place in these areas, and we'll see whether uh, it's too little too late or whether we can really turn things around there. Finally, the unity-based approach. We need to recognize and promote that we will all live on one very small planet. We all share a human destiny, uh, that uh, unless we work together to be able to help each other meet our needs, then uh, we destroy our common wealth and uh, our, our common capacity um, to be able to flourish and sustain development and, uh, and uh, expansion of human dignity. So uh, I'll finish with this slide. Um, the, uh, the shift needs to be from an emphasis just on what we call track one, or first track diplomacy, the official governmental diplomacy, to much more multi-track diplomacy where we engage people in all sectors of society. If 85% of civilians, uh, of, of uh, people being killed in wars currently are civilians, then civilians are on the front line. So it's a civil society responsibility to be able to build peace and to prevent war. It's not just any longer a government matter. Uh, the governments can't do it on their own. Through second track diplomacy, uh, which is what uh, we've been engaged in over the last 20 years, uh, but also, uh, track three, four through nine, and uh, Batula Gulen has particularly emphasized track nine, the media, and track seven, the religious tracks, and particularly with religions. If we don't include and integrate religion and spiritual approaches to peace uh, within our peacemaking, then we leave the field open for, uh, for others to be able to twist and distort those traditions to justify uh, escalation of violence. So we have to recognize the value of spiritual leaders in being able to uh, tap the enormous resources, not only of Islam, but all the great religious traditions and cultural traditions around the world for peace. Mobilize and integrate uh, that into a multi-track approach to peace rather than leaving it 
um, for abuse, misuse uh, by others. So thank you.